Today's thrill seekers demand more extreme kicks than ever before. Each year, theme parks spend millions of dollars satisfying this desire by building faster, taller, and scarier rides, which promise ultimate speeds, ultimate G forces, and ultimate thrills. This has been made possible by new propulsion technologies using pneumatics, electromagnetics and hydraulics which have allowed designers to create a new breed of ultimate thrill rides. Imagine a phenomenal three seconds of weightlessness. Being catapulted head over heels towards concrete 30 metres below you. Or dangling in mid-air as you fly like a bird. Spinning on three axes as you tumble and somersault in mid-air. Or accelerate faster than a Ferrari and then twist 450 degrees. For the new breed of ultimate rides, the only constraints on the designer's imagination are the limits of technology and the limits of human physiology. Leading the new generation of ultimate rides was Superman the Escape. In 1999, it broke the world record for the fastest and tallest thrill ride. We wanted to do two things. We wanted to build the fastest ride, fastest thrill ride anywhere in the world and break the 100 mile an hour barrier. And we wanted to be the tallest thrill ride in the world. And we did that when we came out at 415 feet. The incredible momentum created by the launch carries the train up the 127 meter tower, higher than a 41 story building. overcomes momentum and the passengers return to Earth backwards. Once the train returns to the horizontal track, the same motors that launched it act as brakes to bring it to a smooth stop. To achieve the astonishing acceleration, Superman's creators looked beyond the accepted propulsion methods. Since the 1850s, traditional roller coasters, like this wooden one, have relied on gravity as a propulsion system. The speed of the ride was dependent on the height of the first drop. To achieve the 127-metre world record, Superman would have had to have had a first drop of more than 240 metres. It would also require a huge amount of space. If you wanted to have a traditional roller coaster with a normal lift that you're used to seeing, in order to get a 415 foot height, your lift would have to be in excess of 800 feet long. And when you take into account that a chain is going to have to go up that lift and down that lift and, and the other configurations it's going to need, the weight of the chain alone is going to require motors and gearboxes and, and arrangements that would just make it practically impossible to use conventional chain to do. To get round these problems, Superman's designers chose a revolutionary propulsion system, linear synchronous motors. These electromagnetic motors were developed to launch missiles as part of the Star Wars defense system. The linear synchronous motor challenge was a tremendous challenge, actually. It had never been used in any commercial application at all. Uh, there had been some uh, work in a military application for linear synchronous motors, 
So when we brought it in and started to apply it, we had a, a lot of obstacles to overcome. The secret behind linear synchronous motors is magnetism. Magnets on the track repel opposing magnets on the bottom of the train, lifting it up. So the train floats on a frictionless magnetic field. To create forward momentum, computers control the polarity of the magnets in the track so that they alternately attract and repel the magnets in the train. This rapid attraction and repulsion means Superman's motors both push and pull the train forwards. This system is so effective it can accelerate the train to 174 kilometers an hour in just seven seconds. We're pulling the car through the front of the magnet and pushing the car out the back of the magnet. That requires a tremendous amount of processor speed and the ability to switch large amounts of electricity in order to make that electromagnet do it. Uh, coming up with a computer network that was reliable enough and quick enough to make that switch gear move that power in the motors was the challenge that we had. Go! Superman riders experience the sensation of being pinned to their seat, followed by the feeling of weightlessness. These sensations are what provide the thrill in thrill rides, and what creates them are G-forces. A few G-forces can be exhilarating, but the human body can only endure so much before we pass out. And in extreme circumstances, G-forces can even be killed. Human beings all live daily with G-force. The force of one G is the force of the Earth's gravitational pull that a person feels when they're at rest on the Earth's surface. In other words, a person would feel their normal weight. However, when an individual experiences higher than one G, they feel heavier, equivalent to the number of Gs. At three Gs, they would feel three times as heavy. When a person feels weightless, they're experiencing zero G. Tim Burkhart explains. When a rider rides Superman, there's uh, obviously two prominent G-forces that they're going to experience, positive Gs and negative Gs. The positive Gs really are what you feel during that tremendous boost of acceleration. You're just being pushed back into the seat, and you get that feeling of a uh, rocket launch or, uh, or being launched off an aircraft carrier or riding in a race car. It's, it's just a great feeling being pushed back into the seat. And then, conversely, when you're coming down the drop, those forces work the opposite direction and are negative forces that create the weightless feeling. And again, on Superman, you get almost three seconds of weightlessness. And virtually every roller coaster built has some degree of weightlessness to it, but it's typically measured in tenths of a second. On Superman, you're going to experience for about three seconds. This weightless feeling creates the bottom out of the seat experience what thrill riders call airtime. Watch the breast pop into the man in the middle of the car. At the moment of zero G, he stops with the train because he's held in his seat. However, his sunglasses, which are not strapped in, continue to travel in a straight line upwards. If the man was not restrained, he would join his sunglasses. Research on test pilots has shown that humans can only tolerate small amounts of negative G because, while accelerating downwards, the liquid part of your body, blood, lags behind the solid parts, bones and organs. Too much negative G will cause a rush of blood to the brain and the pilot will literally see red and then collapse in what is called a red out. a more positive G than negative, but even so, designers have to work within limits. If a healthy person is subjected to too much positive G, they will start to lose their vision at around 6G, and at 9G, blood will flow from the brain and they will black out. At 14G, they will die. All thrill-ride designers manipulate positive and negative G-forces, but what are they really trying to achieve when they create an ultimate ride? 
one of the theme park industry's most admired visionaries, started his career in cinema, making special effects for James Bond films. Today, he is one of the most successful thrill ride designers in the world. Enthusiasts believe that John Wardley has been responsible for many of the greatest rides ever made. When I create a ride, my ultimate goal is the end result to give people a thrilling, exciting, amazing experience. And that experience is something that we determine in the brief for the design of the ride. So we might be wanting to give people a scary experience or an intimidating one. We might want to enchant them, to baffle them. All these emotions are the emotions that other forms of entertainment manipulate whether you're in the theatre or the film industry or us in the theme park industry, we are doing the same thing. We're playing with people's emotions and giving people an entertaining time. To manipulate our emotions and give us the thrills we crave, thrill ride designers use the laws of physics. This ride, Enterprise, is a classic example. It was created in the 1970s and it still inspires designers today. I'm about to be spun round in a circle, vertically upside down, 25 metres in the air, and yet there is nothing going to be holding me in my seat. There are no seat belts, no lap bars, no over-the-shoulder restraints, nothing is going to hold me in when I am upside down on this wheel, 25 metres in the air. Well, what on earth is it that's holding me in? Well, some of you might say centrifugal force. Well, the physicists don't like people talking about centrifugal force. They talk about centripetal force. But what is this force? Well, it's very simple, really, when you understand. Basically, anybody in motion wants to go in a dead straight line unless some force tries to nudge it off course. So when you throw an object, that object wants to go in a perfect straight line, but gravity pulls you back down to Earth. So when I'm on this wheel, spinning round as I am, I don't really want to go around in a circle at all. I want to be projected in a dead straight line. Yet the seat that I'm sitting on is constantly nudging me around in a circle towards the centre in order to make me spin around. And the force that that seat is applying to me is what we call centripetal force. So it, it's dead easy when you think about it, and it's also great fun. While Enterprise uses centripetal force to hold you in your seat, the latest generation of thrill rides uses the same force to give you the sensation of being thrown out of it. SkySWAT opened in 2003 and creates a unique pulled out of your seat experience. <laughs> Skyswat's creator wanted to give riders a new kind of thrill. A lot of people like to go up the hill on the roller coaster and then go towards the ground. But then when they get to the ground, they go this way. I want to be able to let them dive towards the ground and then look like they're going to for sure hit the ground and swing underneath. And that was the whole concept there. Skyswat is the first of its kind in the world. Astro World director Ken Moulsby supervised its construction. They have a piston that pulls the cables tight and lifts us up. So it's a very smooth, computer-controlled process. The computer is monitoring all the time the air pressure in these cylinders. And so what it does is, is as we're rising up here, it's monitoring constantly how fast the boom is rising and how much air it needs to add to make us come smoothly up to the top. When we get to the top here, there are locking pins, and those lock the trolleys that carries the pivot in, and you can feel us settle into place at the top. 
Now we're hooked up to the main power that will rotate. We have some locking pins that are going to go in place and we begin to rotate. And depending which side of the ride you're on, you may start backward and you may start forward. But this is really a nice ride because you feel yourself being pulled out of the seat. That's what produces, I think, a lot of the screen. The sensation of just being pulled out of your seat the whole time. And it's really a terrific ride to ride on the day. When you, you know, it's warm outside, which it is a lot in Houston, because you can just feel the wind rushing by as you go. The end of this boom travels at peak speed, about 30 miles per hour. So it's really kind of a nice feeling to get the wind rushing. And I like this over the top. And you can look down and just see the ground and the concrete coming at you. And uh, it really is a very joy, over the top feeling to just be going completely upside down while it goes. And, uh, you know, being a technical guy, I like to be able to feel the motors pushing and pushing and doing their thing. You can feel a little bit of that as they go through. Without state-of-the-art restraints, Kent and the other Sky Swatch riders would be flung to a certain death. Kent explains some of Sky Swatch's vital technology. The restraints on this ride are designed to hold you in while you go upside down. This one rocks, locks twice at the pivot point. And this one pulls down and locks on my shoulder, so I have two different restraints. Then it telescopes here to lock it in. The seat confines me enough to where this still will retain me in the seat no matter what happens. But there is a design trade-off between safety and excitement, and this has always concerned Stan Jackets. The greater challenge there is to put a restraint on that that doesn't enclose you so terribly much that the experience is lost. See, it's all relative. In other words, I, we could build a restraint as all a bunch of foam and cover you completely up and hold your head, nice big foam stuff, but then you've lost the experience. And I've said for years and years, we need to get the restraint smaller and smaller so that your exposure is greater because that's what pumps up our adrenaline. Sky Sports restraint system will hold in comfort a vast range of people, from a seven-year-old girl to a 108-kilogram rugby player, yet still let them enjoy an adrenaline-pumping thrill. On this ride, the restraints have a different but equally important role. They create the illusion of being able to fly. This engineering breakthrough was developed for a radical new British ride called Air. It's the first ride in the world where you fly like a bird, and it uses the ultimate in harness technology. When riders embark on air, they pull down a restraint which has twin locks and is computer controlled. Underneath is a remarkable flexible jacket made from neoprene, a synthetic rubber that automatically molds to the rider's shape so that everyone feels comfortable and is completely safe. Even when the floor falls away and you are tipped face down. Air is another design triumph for John Wardley. His aim is to give the rider the unique sensation of smooth flight. And I am now extremely secure and, to be honest, very comfortable indeed. And it's a good job because in a minute I am going to be taken about uh, 30 metres in the air and then drop down a great drop tumbled over on my back, spun around as if I'm flying. And you really do feel as if you're about to fly. I don't need to uh, hold on with my arms. Here we go, down the first drop, and you're like a bird. You're flying through the air. This is like no other roller coaster. Wow. And now I'm rolling over on my back. It's an amazing sensation. Turning back over onto my front and diving down underground, down from the tunnel, up around, over the heads of everybody below me. Another barrel roll. 
but you feel as if you are flying where you would want to go if you were a bird. I'm not being wrenched in directions that my body doesn't want to take me. It is so incredibly smooth. And the most beautiful sensation of flight. So there you have it, air, the world's first real flying roller coaster. It just gives you a really good head rush. When you first like go down, it feels like you're gonna fall out because it's just drop like that. It was really scary, as so, though like if anything went wrong, you could actually fall out. Well-designed seats can enhance the ride, but never before have they provided the main buzz. The designers of this ride have given the thrill ride laws of physics a new twist. They have pushed the accepted boundaries of human endurance further than ever before. In 2002, a revolutionary new ride called X was unveiled. It not only twists riders, but spins them on all three axes, vertically, horizontally and diagonally. This is made possible by radical technological advances in its unique seating system. For the very first time, thrill seekers ride in vehicles that can spin independently 360 degrees. This generates an unprecedented level of unpredictability, as the passengers have no idea what is going to happen next. X was inspired by wanting to do things that you weren't really allowed to do with the traditional roller coaster because you were limited to following the rails. But with X, what we're able to do now is rotate those guests to positions that they can handle the acceleration levels more comfortably. It also allowed us to put the guests in positions that tended to be a little more thrilling or scary. They were able to see things that they weren't able to see before because we could rotate them in positions that they could see the ground where they normally couldn't see the ground because the floorboard was in the way. Or they could do a flip or something like that as they're moving along a relatively smooth section of track. And so it opened up a lot more design flexibility by using the X system. On X, riders are perched on the edge of a massive six meter wide train and then plummeted 60 meters to the ground head first. Next, they race at 120 kilometers an hour, spinning head over heels while performing forward and backward acrobatics. Unlike traditional coasters, this ride has four rails. Two are for the train to travel along, and the other two, in the center of the track, colored yellow, control the spin of the chairs. Located along the yellow rails is a system of wheels and gears which enable the seated rider to be rotated while hurtling along the track. This ingenious technology allows the passengers to experience even more thrills and g-force than ever before. X takes its riders to the very limit of their endurance. Using sophisticated computer graphics, the X-Ride designers were able to pinpoint the precise g-forces at any stage of the ride. The software allowed them to program moves that would rotate a rider out of danger if the computer predicted that the g-force limit was about to be breached. When you're designing a roller coaster, you don't want to throw people out of their seat because that's uncomfortable. And it also throws them into the restraints, which they pushes onto their shoulders or onto their lap bar, depending on the restraint system. And so if you can orient the guest relative to those accelerations so that you're pushing down into the seat or into the back of the seat, then it makes it more comfortable for them and they can handle higher acceleration levels than they could if it was in a different direction.
X has won numerous awards for its remarkable engineering, and many enthusiasts believe that it is the best thrill ride ever constructed. But some crave a more primeval thrill. While some thrill rides are designed to trigger a cocktail of different sensations, others are custom made to achieve a specific psychological effect. With Oblivion, the technology is geared to intimidate you. Oblivion is the first drop roller coaster in the world. While queuing, passengers are told that they could die. Riding Oblivion rates higher on the terror scale than any other ride. The six-ton train climbs very slowly up a vertical rail. It then edges towards a ledge where the track apparently hangs unsupported in mid-air. As the train slips over the edge, it dangles over a 55-metre drop for what seems like an eternity. The riders then hurtle towards the black hole in the ground far below. As they enter the void, they're sprayed with a mist which momentarily conceals the route underground. Purely for psychological effects, we hold you at the top of the drop for about three seconds to build up the adrenaline before you drop. Now, of course, with a normal roller coaster, you couldn't do this because as soon as you leave the top of the chain lift, you're actually rolling under gravity. So your, your movement from the top of the chain lift is actually controlled by a series of quite complicated conveyors. Uh, one of them being a vertical chain conveyor that's the reverse of, of the lift that we're climbing at the moment. So that you are engaging on a chain and that chain then holds you at the top of the precipice for three seconds. For most people it feels like 33 seconds, it feels like an eternity. But you're just held there for three seconds and then a clutch releases and the chain allows you to drop. From that moment on, you really are free running. So we're now engaging on that chain conveyor now. It's now stopping, pausing. The clutch is gonna release and away we go. Oblivion plunges 55 meters in just 2.2 seconds. But even this is not enough for some sensation seekers. For years, adrenaline junkies have pitted themselves against one of the ultimate forces of nature, Niagara Falls, by going over them in a barrel. Most have not lived to tell the tale, but if you can't face going over Niagara Falls, then try the perilous plunge. It's only a few meters shorter, and you can experience the thrill of going over a waterfall without dying. This is the tallest water ride in the world. It plunges you 36 meters at a near vertical 78 degrees. Oh, and you do get wet. The magnetic brakes and 75 and a half thousand litres of water seem to that. Not Berry Farm's chief engineer, Mark Schuler, explains how the world's tallest and steepest water drop ride relies on magnets. Uh, the boat you're in uh, weighs approximately 14,000 pounds empty. It's fitted with permanent magnets on the bottom of the boat, uh, which we'll be using when we get to the bottom of the drop to help slow us down. 
uh, that and the uh, large volume of water uh, down there bring the boat to a nice smooth slowdown. And we're just crowning the top of the lift at 125 feet. Nice view of the area. We go around the turn and uh, get prepared to go on down the drop. Now let's drop 78 degrees and we're gonna join 20,000 gallons of water here so it's gonna get wet. That's a bit of water. Uh, just got to experience the, uh, the effects of magnetic braking. You add a little bit of water to help slow us down to this nice stop. If perilous plunge relied on water alone to stop the boat, it would need three times the distance. Big drop rides are now a must-have thrill in any modern theme park. But 10 years ago, this type of tower ride didn't exist. This is Power Tower. When it opened in 1998, it was the tallest tower ride in the world and pioneered the new thrill ride technology of pneumatics, using compressed air in some of the largest cylinders ever made. Riders are blasted downwards at a force greater than gravity. A negative G rush of blood to the head is guaranteed with this ride. That's one of the most unbelievable rides I've ever ridden in my life. I flew up out of my seat. I love it. She's still but look at it, she's still crying. Still shaking. It's awesome. To get up there, you're able to look over everything, but it happens very quickly. The drop was probably the best part of it. Big pants are probably not a good thing, though. You get anxious, nervous, scared, excited, and then it's over. <laughs> Power Tower riders have a choice. As well as being blasted down, they can be shot skywards. Power Tower's creator, Stan Chekit's inspiration for the ride came from his children. I've raised nine rugrats, nine curtain crawlers, nine house apes, whatever you want to call them. And every single one of them, you pick them up a little bit. As they get a little older, you just throw them a little higher and catch them. All I was doing is taking the adults and throwing them, you know, 180, 200 feet in the air a little faster. And so that's how it evolved. It's just that that's what creates the thrill. Then we sat down with the team, a lot of great engineers. How can we create that ride? Not let's build a ride, but how can we create that thrill? And that's exactly how that came about. This ride is... Um really interesting because it's all powered by air. Essentially the uh, car vehicle is weighed and they determine the weight of the passengers and then it's driven up uh, to the top with a small amount of air. Um, the calculations it makes based on the weight or how much air it will store so that it can launch the vehicle. When we get to the very top we'll be held by four little mechanical brakes. This is what I like best about it. I like being able to look out and see the park. I don't know, I just can't stress it enough how, you know, you get up here and you almost want to stay up here because it's so beautiful. Essentially this ride again is, is all powered by air. We locked into the mechanical brakes at the top, pressurized the system. What I really like is just the, the rush of your, your butt coming off the seat and then you just go with, you know, straight down. We'll um, launch when the, when the four valves throw and throw all the air from the shot tanks into the main tank for the launch. It traps air at the bottom and we act uh, like a big spring that coils us or shoots us back up toward the air and then cushions us nice and softly all the way to the ground. That's definitely the best part. And then these little ones going up and down is really fun. I've been on every ride in this park, and this is definitely one of my favorites because you get that, that, that instant rush as soon as you, your butt lifts off the seat. It's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Uh, 
The other two towers, coloured red, use the same technology to blast passengers up. I'm going to get whiplash. Oh, yeah. Don't not trip. Not trip. <laughs> Basically, how it works is you have cylinders, you have a, a, a series of them, so you got safety. You got these cylinders, inside the cylinder's a piston, and then and it pushes the cable, and the cable's what moves the car, the gondola, or whatever you're on. Basically, it's really simple. It's move the piston, move the cable, move the person. So you, you pump up the air, you got an air tank or a storage tank, you call it accumulator, pump all that energy in there, Right when you're ready to go, boom, you release all that energy and push that piston one way and you go the other way. As the rides have become increasingly sophisticated, maintenance has become more important than ever before. Every moving part is checked and checked again every single day. Park owners know that a serious accident would probably result in financial ruin. As a result, the manufacturers build large safety margins into their rides. On the power tower, the cables which support the riders are a vital component, so they have a particularly detailed inspection. Well, I run my hand down the cable. I'm looking for any kind of imperfection as far as like a little bump in the cable or anything. If that's found, the inner core of the cable has damage, and we will be taking this cable off and replacing it. The theme park industry prides itself on its safety record. Statistically, you're a million times more likely to die driving to a theme park than traveling on any of the rides. At the Power Tower factory, standards are regularly monitored and improved. Each batch of cable is tested to destruction. This cable is designed to have a breaking point ten times greater than is needed on the ride. In this test, the cable broke at 17,000 kilos, the weight of two double-decker buses. Components in thrill rides must pass stringent fail-safe standards. And when you have a ride that blasts you to 190 kilometers per hour in four seconds, they need to. This is today's ultimate ride, Top Thrill Dragster. It's the fastest and tallest thrill ride in the world, shooting you up 128 metres, more than twice the height of Niagara Falls, in just eight seconds. Are you ready for the highest and fastest coaster in the world? Are you ready for Top Thrill Dragster? been described by some as better than sex. Riders strap themselves into cars resembling top fuel dragsters. They're then accelerated to 190 kilometers an hour in a mere four seconds. But unlike a conventional dragster, the cars then zoom upwards, rotate, ride the crest of the curve, 
crash down vertically, twist once more, and finally reach 190 kilometers per hour for a second time. Dragster is an experience that people don't forget. Oh, that was amazing! What a twenty! Rider, how was your record-breaking ride? This is the view from the front row, and it's not been edited, sped up, or altered in any way. From a safety standpoint, the ride is extremely safe. The launch has to be between 120 and 122 miles an hour. A difference of two, one, you know, one mile an hour at that point would either cause a rollback or, or an overspeed going over the tower. From a rider safety standpoint, we have an individual seatbelt that locks uh, on each passenger. It has twin locks in each buckle, so no single buckle failure or a single lock failure in a buckle would cause a, a safety problem. On top of that, we have an individual single lap bar that comes down in the passenger's seat, has two locking cylinders on it. No single cylinder failure would cause the lap bar to open up. So you have to have at least two cylinder failures before you have any problems. To create the extraordinary propulsion system, the designers adapted and combined two existing technologies. They used hydraulics with pistons pushing oil to launch the cars and magnets to stop them. system is essentially uh, a really, really uh, simple system. It pumps oil out of a tank up into four accumulators, and they put it into very high pressure oil. You know, it's, it's like a, a 250 bar. And essentially, they pump that oil in there and pump it up against nitrogen, which is compressed and acts like a spring. On a signal, the oil is released and runs through 32 hydraulic motors that creates a zero to 120 mile an hour launch. Arms down. trains are um, stopped with a whole series of magnetic brakes that are all mounted to the bottoms of the trains. During the launch, you'll see a whole series of copper alloy fins drop down below the train. And when the copper alloy fins are down, then there are no, uh, nothing breaking the train, nothing slowing it down. When the copper alloy fins are up, they interfere with a magnetic field between the magnets, and that brings the train to a halt. You want to ride that one over and over again. Oh, yeah. Clear. Head back. Right. Hold on. Very scared. <laughs> Gotta hold on tight here. Arms down. Just arms down, head back, and hold on. Waiting for the Christmas tree to count down. The magnetic brakes are gonna drop. We roll back a little bit. We're about to go. There we go! Feet. Over the top! Coming down! Oh my goodness! Oh. 
Oh no, stay down! Cops growing! It's always higher and faster, it always will be. I don't like limits, do you? So what will the next ultimate ride be like? I can give you a hint, absolutely, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Hold on to the grab bar until the ride comes to a complete stop. 